Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat Shea from uh, Wichi, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. I was on this campus many, many years ago. My husband is actually a graduate of Holy Cross, so he was delighted to tag along on this uh, particular trip. So we're based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and Wichi's uh, territory begins with the Dakotas and moves west to um, include Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. So, um, where's the clicker? Um, today what we're going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to talk about what uh, the interstate passport is, and uh, why and where, um, and how it was developed. And then Jane is going to talk about how it works, uh, who's involved in it, and how the New England states and institutions could also um, be involved. So WICHE has a number of regional projects, but we also have some national projects. You're probably familiar with knocking at the college door, um, the uh, multi-state um, longitudinal uh, data exchange that Michael mentioned earlier, and Interstate Passport is also uh, one of those. So the Interstate Passport is a program that facilitates block transfer of lower division general education based on learning outcomes, not based on specific courses and credits. So it's not course by course articulation. And the goal of it is to eliminate the unnecessary repetition of learning that's already achieved and with the intent of ultimately saving students money and um, increasing their uh, persistence and graduation. So it is based on 63 learning outcomes that were um, developed by faculty from institutions in seven of uh, the western uh, Wichi states. And those learning outcomes are spread across nine uh, particular learning areas, and we'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. And each is supported by examples of the ways in which faculty are assessing those learning outcomes in their uh, curriculum. And so um, the passport is founded on the, the principles that it does is that it respects institutional autonomy. And so no institution is expected to adopt the passport learning outcomes. The institutions determine that their learning outcomes are congruent with and cover the same range of learning as the interstate passports learning outcomes. So you can think of the learning outcomes as a bridge um, among the different institutions. And it also does not uh, dictate what kinds of assessments uh, should be used to measure those learning outcomes. Uh, it's founded on the principle that that's a faculty's responsibility to determine what uh, would be appropriate uh, curriculum to address those learning outcomes and what are the appropriate ways to assess them. So uh, John talked about this study, so I won't, uh, won't repeat it other than to say that we know that losing credits uh, makes a significant difference and whether students complete or not, and that's why we undertook this particular initiative. In this particular one, this is National Student Clearinghouse data, and it shows the uh, percent of students who are graduating in the state with prior enrollments in another state. So um, you can see on the western, in the Wichi region, uh, that darker shade of turquoise means that it's 20% or more. And what we found is 11 out of our 15 states uh, had transfer, um, had students who were graduating in a state with prior enrollments in another state. The national average in this particular study was 14.6. So I know New England is a little hard to see, but you also have some um, pretty dark areas. So uh, Connecticut is at 18%, Massachusetts at 18%. Uh, Maine at 17, New Hampshire at 23, Rhode Island at 23, and Vermont at 30%. So how was the passport developed? 
We have two organizations that are based at WICHE. One is uh, an alliance of chief academic officers for the two-year schools, and another one that is composed of the chief academic officers of the four-year schools. So the um, alliance members were having an executive committee meeting and talking about the uh, problem that they were having in all of their states with students taking courses at the two-year schools, then transferring to the four-year schools, and losing credits. And what was happening was the students were getting angry at the two-year schools for having taken courses that had no market value, and they were angry at the four-year schools for not accepting credits, so they've wasted time and money from their point of view. And so um, the um, members of that executive committee said there has to be a better way than doing this. And a number of our state, four of our states at the time were LEAP states, um, which is the AAC new program, Liberal Education and America's Promise, which had identified as some essential learning outcomes. And they said, why can't we create a new way of transfer, a new currency, and that currency would be learning outcomes, because that's what's really important, what students know and can do. And they said, but this will never work unless we have our four-year colleagues at the table. So we then convened a meeting, and there were um, there was a, a representative from the two-year schools, a representative from the four-year schools, so those were chief academic officers typically, and then they could choose one other person to come, and that was a transfer and articulation specialist. And so over a period of a couple of days, they worked out this idea of creating a transfer, um, a new program for transfer for just lower division general education because that's a commonality among the institutions. And it's a very important foundation for students, about 25% um, towards that four-year degree. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more then how that transpired. Um, they picked nine, this is nine different academic areas that they would um, focus on in the passport. That was oral communication, written communication, quantitative literacy, human cultures, human society and the individual, creative expression, and uh, natural sciences, and then critical thinking, and teamwork and value systems as the cross-cutting skill areas. And Jane will tell you a little bit more about that. So each state um, sent teams of faculty to these meetings uh, to talk about learning outcomes. And the states that were involved in this are Oregon, uh, Cal or California, Hawaii, North Dakota, Oregon, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Now this project started out very much focused with faculty. In fact, the, the um, leadership team set up some guiding principles for developing this uh, particular program. And that was that it be faculty driven from the start, it be student focused, it uh, respect institutional autonomy, and that there would be quality assurance measures built in. And so um, it was the faculty that developed the learning outcomes, but we've got some other pieces that were developed by registrars and in institutional researchers, academic advisors are involved, uh, the campus marketing staff are involved. So it's, it's almost like the whole village uh, is involved in making this program work. Um, the faculty worked together over a period of uh, five years, really, to develop these learning outcomes and to uh, also come up with the, some examples of proficiency that um, are used to measure the learning outcomes. Um, they are based on the oops, based on the uh, lead essential learning outcomes and some research that uh, which he had done uh, previously. Here's, here's kind of the process that they used. Each state brought, if they had a state set of learning outcomes, they brought their state set of learning outcomes to this meeting. If there was not a state set in some of these states, what they did is the institutions that were involved got together with the other institutions, the colleagues that they had at other institutions, and came up with what they called a consensus set of learning outcomes. 
So then those teams brought these learning outcomes in each of the nine areas to a meeting at WICHE, put it into this matrix, and then began to talk about where are our commonalities, where are our differences, let's pick the low-hanging fruit first, and, and make that then one of part of the, the uh, passport learning outcome, and let's work out where our differences are, so that ultimately, over a period of several months, we can have a set of learning outcomes to which we all believe we can um, see as a bridge for transfer uh, among our institutions. So that's the process um, that was used. Uh, this is, the work has been funded by four uh, different sources. The Carnegie Corporation of New York uh, provided the proof of concept uh, funding. Then the uh, Gates Foundation and the Illumina Foundation provided support for developing the learning outcomes, for developing the academic progress tracking design. Then we uh, received a First in the World grant from the U.S. Department of Education, which allowed us to create a partnership with the National Student Clearinghouse to uh, put the academic progress tracking into place and begin to uh, scale up this project so that it could, in fact, be a national interstate highway for um, higher education students. So who's involved currently? We have 24 member um, institutions in eight states, um, in California, in Hawaii, in Oregon, uh, Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and the first uh, state outside the Wichita region is Arkansas. In this uh, first academic year, we've just finished our first uh, year of operations, 28,000 students earned passports at about 16 of those institutions. Now we say this is an unofficial count because this is a count that was reported to us. The counts are still being reported to National Clearing, National, uh, clearing House. So um, when the, all of those are in, it'll be official. And so uh, we're beginning to work with other states. Um, the states that you see here, um, the blue states, are the states where we have member institutions that are, are participating. The uh, yellow states, um, which you see Indiana, uh, Ohio, Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and Idaho are states. And we had some grant support to test the constructing uh, the passport block process which is a menu of courses or learning outcomes by which students can achieve a passport at each institution. And that work is still ongoing in some of those states. We also did a um, mapping project with some states, and those are uh, New Mexico, Colorado, and Montana. And in those states, they looked at um, how faculty were uh, teaching to the learning outcomes by rating the assignments that faculty were doing. So faculty would do a, an assignment, provide an assignment. That faculty would, uh, the home faculty would score it, and then it was cross-scored by faculty at another institution. And then they did the same process with the learning outcomes. This was a voluntary process to see if some tool like that might be useful to institutions as they were picking which courses or learning outcomes address the um, I mean learning opportunities, address the um, learning outcomes. The National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, NCHIMS, designed the rubrics for the purposes of that um, exercise, and they are now um, about to uh, release the report uh, to the Passport Review Board just to find out what it was like. That will never be a required um, tool to use. It was designed to be a voluntary tool if institutions uh, wanted something like that. And then there are other states where we're beginning to work um, with them, or we've had recent inquiries. Alaska, we're working with a couple of institutions. Washington, we've just, uh, are very close to working with two institutions there. Uh, the state of Nevada is approaching it uh, more as a uh, statewide kind of activity. Montana's evaluating um, it as a possible statewide activity. Uh, inquiries from uh, Iowa, Nebraska, um, Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, and Maryland. So 
lots of interest developing and uh, we're excited about that. We think it can make a real difference for students and um, we'd love to have some uh, New England uh, states and institutions involved as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jane and she's going to tell you how it works. first and fourth. Um, um, and uh, good morning, it's great to be here. I, um, I've been going to a lot of these different places that you saw on the map, and some of them I've never been to before. I can't say that about Massachusetts. I actually lived in Boston. I lived in Vermont for three years, so it's really nice to get back to this part of the country. Um, this, uh, I'm actually from um, Olympia, Washington, and uh, so I've been working with Wichi in different uh, capacities uh, informally, but this has been a very exciting project that I think um, has great potential. Um, my job here is to tell you a little bit more about how this all works and what it all comes together. One of the things that you have, which we don't you often have, is you have um, all the learning outcomes. So we don't need to talk a lot about that. You can see what they are, exactly how they fit together. Um, so I'm going to go through this part of it a little bit more quickly. Um, let's see. One, two, Um, I'm going to run, I'm not spend a lot of time on these because I think you can see what they all are. They're pretty standard. Um, the only ones that are a little bit unusual are when we get to um, these last two cross-cutting skills, and those come directly from the LEAP um, um, out learning outcomes for a, a baccalaureate education uh, as things that are uh, important for any um, graduate who wants to be a entrepreneur, who wants to be employed in a lot of different ways. Um, so these are um, found in most cases throughout the curriculum and people simply identify uh, where they already do these things in their um, uh, curriculum. Um, the Passport works by an institution, as Pat already mentioned, determining that its own learning outcomes for lower division general education are congruent with and cover the same range of learning as the passport learning outcomes. No one is expected to, and nor do we want anyone to, adopt the, these learning outcomes as their own. These are um, something that is generally acknowledged by most people as covering the kinds of things, the range of learning, that everyone thinks that a general education student who has a general education uh, should be known and be able to do something about this. So um, an institution determines that its outcomes for lower division are, are there, or perhaps in some cases that minor tweaks to your general education program would uh, complete the passport uh, for your students. For example, a specific combination of two courses that would have to both be taken in order to cover something like, I don't know, teamwork or critical thinking or something like that, or maybe one additional course that is not in your curriculum. There are places that um, don't require any fun, um, um, uh, creative expression or fine arts or anything like that. Um, and they might have to find some way to do that. Or they might be able to find that within their curriculum where these outcomes are met in a different kind of a course, like creative writing or something like that. Um, so there are a variety of different ways that people have approached this in terms of, of seeing where they teach these kinds of things. And typically, how the, um, the institution identifies the courses and the lists of choices by which a student can achieve the learning outcomes. How do they do that? Um, a lot institutions will usually um, gather, for example, their general education committee, or they will go to the faculty in, a, in their different um, disciplines that, or colleges within a university that uh, offer the lower division general education courses. And I've seen um, in one community college setting where I was actually there while they were doing this, uh, they had brought together the, the deans of their different departments who had each had brought along uh, their different areas, each of whom had brought along two or three faculty members who taught the introductory courses. And they sat there uh, after we had done the introductory part and asked, 
answered, asked and answered questions, and they took the learning outcomes and sat down with those in, in that setting right there and went through, and the dean would say, okay, where, wh which courses do we teach that covers this one? Which courses do we teach where, where we do that? And they actually completed about 75% of that process right there while they were in the initial workshop. That was a small community college, so I think that was a pretty efficient way for them to do it. Um, but um, so um, then what happens? If an institution decides that they want to participate in the passport, then they uh, sign a, a memorandum of agreement. Uh, what usually happens is you've completed the block, you've figured it out, you've gone through whatever your decision-making processes are at your institution to agree that, yes, this, this covers, you know, basically our general education. We might have done a little tweak here or there, maybe not. Institutions that have um, been working for a long time with learning outcomes as a basis for their uh, programmatic decisions, uh, or, and especially students that have been working with the AAC and use LEAP outcomes are the most prepared usually to make uh, an easy transition. Uh, a great example is the state of Utah that did, did this as an entire um, state. They have been working for years <laughs> using the LEAP outcomes. They are, have done uh, the uh, degree qualifications profiles in a number of areas, the DQP, and, and look, looked at a variety of different ways to, to build learning outcomes into everything that they have done. They bring faculty in these different areas together on an annual basis, representatives from each institution, two and four here. So they were uh, just all poised. This stuff was all in their general education. That was pretty easy for them to do as a whole state. Other states, it's just one institution at a time, or they have to do a lot of negotiating. It's, um, you know, one I think the things that we may not have actually said is that we know that almost every state is working very hard internally to try to uh, make transfer within the state more efficient. Um, and, but almost no one has been working to make this work across state lines. Um, and many students, as you've heard this morning, are transferring across state lines. And I look at the uh, statistics that you had on the map for you know, the New England states, and some of you don't have all that many students who graduate in your state that have uh, come from someplace else. But what you may not know, what I don't know, is how many students started in your state that then ended up going someplace else. And those are students that we're thinking about too. Those are the ones that we're, we think will benefit um, as, as well uh, from something like uh, efficient transport based on a transfer based on a passport. Um, so um, an institution that signs a, a memorandum of agreement uh, just agrees to award an interstate, interstate passport to students who earn it. This is both two- and four-year institutions. <coughs> For most four-year institutions, most of your students who earn a passport are not going to go anywhere with it. They will have it. They'll have a, uh, this is kind of like a little credential, that they'll have completed a, a passport, which in most cases will pretty much be very similar to your own general education requirements. Um, but uh, then you agree to, uh, you know, if they do transfer, they'll have something to take with them. Uh, for the most part, that won't be an issue at a four-year institution. But an institution then agrees to accept an interstate passport from any entering student as completion of all lower division general education requirements. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, many uh, um, private nonprofit uh, institutions are faith-based institutions um, that um, clearly will have some kind of uh, philosophy or religion requirements that will be beyond uh, the general education. Uh, in a couple of cases we've run into, there are specific legislatively mandated courses, like a course in Wyoming state history, for example, <laughs> um, that you have to have as, a, have as a graduation requirement. And that, of course, is outside of this, too. But whether you have two courses in humanities or, or three, or one course in social science or two, or whether you require seven credits of, of uh, you know, in natural sciences or six, or um, uh, one lab or two labs. I don't know if anyone doesn't require labs. That's part of natural sciences, but uh, <clears throat> are not relevant to this process. That's not something you would be looking at. Um, of when you take the, a passport from someone else. You're looking at, have they um, 
uh, affirmed that they that their students who come with a passport have uh, pretty much covered these learning outcomes, and that you can see that those are consistent with your own. Uh, then um, there is the report to the National Student Clearinghouse. We work very closely with them, um, and um, that on the GPA of transfer students, uh, in order to be able to report back to the sending institutions, which the National Student Clearinghouse handles that, and <coughs> the reporting back, uh, the success of their students in terms of persistence and the GPA after two uh, terms, uh, one, year, one term and two terms, uh, so that they can see how successful they are at preparing uh, students for transfer. Passport blocks. One of the things that um, we've seen is that almost all um, the passport blocks are between 30 and 38 semester credits, uh, usually 32 to 34, 36 are the most common ones. Um, and there's a lot of commonalities you can expect in terms of what's required, <coughs> in terms of courses. <coughs> What you have in your packet is just one example, <coughs> which is the University of South Dakota. Um, the courses and the selections, and you can see on the front page of that, uh, they have identified a list of courses within which the critical uh, thinking outcomes are met, for example, in there, that have those as part of those courses. They have identified uh, teamwork um, courses. They, those are not specifically listed separately on this, but where you can find the teamwork. Usually those are um, lab courses, uh, they may be um, uh, some of the uh, communications courses, sometimes they like, you might even find them in uh, drama, for example, a theater course, or um, a variety of different places where you can see that they uh, not only um, require, but also teach a teamwork. This is an important outcome of classes in terms of how it's. Worked. So you can see what those are. Uh, some large universities have much longer lists of courses where they have uh, determined. Some small community colleges have lists that would fit on the front. Um, they cover all six areas, uh, which just means there are more limited choices. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that transfer level proficiency, what does that mean? For a passport, you have to have a C in each course that's part of your passport. Uh, faculty meeting in these different areas, as you can well imagine, um, we're not willing to say that getting an A in English means that you're proficient at a D level in science, some part. Uh, each um, area requires proficiency so that you can say, what we're talking about are students who you um, have confidence are prepared to be, not that they necessarily will, but they are prepared to be successful at the next level when they transfer. And um, the reverse is that you have students that coming in that you're comfortable are prepared to be successful at your institution. Um, and many um, institutions require a C of all the transfer courses, or all the courses, or sometimes it's requires C at least in your uh, written communication class, or something like that. But for the purposes of the passport, uh, if a C is required in each of the areas, in every, in every course, I should say that. Um, you can see, can't really see this here, but down here it says interstate passport, <coughs> that's on a transcript. Um, registrars got together and yeah, <laughs> registrars got together from the from the states that were working on this, and um, there have been many meetings of registrars, of advisors, of IR people, and, and all of these areas. But uh, they devised uh, among them at this point three different mechanisms for that they were um, that were consistent with their institutional processes for. Um, and it's not necessarily the same for everyone. Different people have different cultures or different approaches to how they uh, um, certify things on transcripts. Um, so then um, the academic tracking uh, is uh, done by the National Student Clearinghouse. 
Um, one part of that is Passport Verify, which is that that's submitted along with all of your completions and degree, all the information that you provide about students. It uh, goes to the National Student Clearinghouse. They put that into their piece that has to do with the passport that they're working with you. Then the academic progress tracking is that when a student completes a passport, when you accept a student with a passport, um, then you report for the next two terms on what their GPA is and if they persisted, along with students that you have awarded passports to and students who have uh, transferred in without a passport. And this is for comparison purposes, and we can do the research on success rates and how this affects students' um, success and completion um, after transfer. Um, there will be annual reports from the National Student Clearinghouse back to each participating institution who has sent students on so that they will be able to see exactly what the success rates are of their students that they have that have transferred out of their institutions. And then aggregate uh, information uh, will be reported to the Passport Review Board, I get to talk more about that later, so that they know uh, if students from all the institutions or participants um, are being successful. And there are strategies and, and things that happen, <laughs> plan to happen uh, if institutions are not preparing students uh, if the dot have adequately for success at the next level. Um, quality assurance, we've talked about most of these already. Uh, the minimum grade of C in every passport course, tracking student progress after transferring. The Passport Review Board is made up of uh, a one representative from each state that is a member or that has at least one institution that's a member. Um, and then uh, several transfer uh, specialists who are part of that board, uh, too. Uh, it's uh, based at Wichi and uh, meets in person once a year. It's meeting at the end of this month. Um, and they are responsible for policy, for reviewing what um, is um, the success rates, which is not really part of something we can see yet, as Pat talked about. We're just beginning to see of uh, students completing passports and being awarded passports. Um, but they also are in charge of all of these learning outcomes and the teams that did the work on these. And they are, this this year, they will be approving a, um, a, uh, a schedule of review for bringing faculty together from all of the states that by that time are members and to look at the outcomes because we don't expect those to be static education evolves, knowledge evolves, and um, it's assumed that some things will change over time um, in terms of what people want to see um, in the outcomes for general education learning. Um, there's currently a, a one of the funded pieces of this uh, project is the evaluation research study of the passport's impact by a whole variety of demographics and geographics and a lot of other uh, ask variables that is being managed by the um, Education and Employment Research Center at Rutgers University. Eventually, we'll have some results of that. Um, right now, we're just getting data in, <laughs> getting information, mostly from um, state experiences and then eventually student experiences as transfers uh, become more prevalent. Um, Pat mentioned the mapping critical assignments uh, which was done, um, it, it's just been completed and we're about to get the report on that. Part of that process is um, the, the assurance that, um, or finding out if, uh, faculty assignments and student work products are similar across states and across sectors between two and four year institutions. Do faculty have similar expectations for what a high quality student work product is? Are they making similar kinds of assignments in terms of the level of expectations they have of students? Um, so that's the kind of thing that can be, I think, um, teased out to some degree by this kind of mapping project. It was based on and expanded from the multi-state collaboratives that some of you may have been participating in um, here. Um, um, and one of the differences with that, I think, between uh, many of those other things is that this um, project is the only one that we know of to date, um, that widespread project that is really focusing on the transfer level. We have uh, some that are looking at, say, 
75% uh, of, the, of the lower division or the baccalaureate level or um, those kinds of things. But this one is, in, is specifically intended to be the transfer level at the end of basically two years or sooner, whatever the point is, is that that coursework that students are, are taking in their general education program. Um, Benefits to students. Well, obviously, we <coughs> talked about those. Knowing in advance of transfer that all of their general education will transfer. Um, saving time and money, increasing the chance for degree completion. The um, information that uh, uh, John was telling us about was really um, fed into our thinking about this, the idea that students who lose credits, the more credits they lose, the less likely they are to ever complete, even if they transfer. So this is really um, part of that um, uh, process. So we've been in going around to the different states, the ones that are members, the ones that we've been have been inviting us to come make presentations. <clears throat> There's so many different reasons that states and institutions are interested in in uh, thinking about um, and the the interstate passport. And I just, we just wanted to share a few of those with you. Some of them I can actually tell you where they came from. Others I, I really don't remember. But these are all things we specifically heard from different states. Uh, obviously, students who, um, some, a lot of institutions uh, want more students. And they know that they can get students from uh, nearby states, but they think they can do it better and more efficiently if they um, could make some kind of a guarantee about their lower division learning. Um, <laughs> uh, lots of states have legislatures who have said, you know, fix transfer. And many of those legislatures, unfortunately, are trying to say, and do it this way. Um, and there's a lot of institutional resistance to things that standardize curriculum in ways that don't give you a lot of wiggle room in terms of evolving your own curriculum or, or changing how you know, how things are put together at your institution or what faculty can teach. Um, institutions are often um, um, very much interested in seeing a way through this, this transfer challenge that does not involve total standardization in, in how they, they teach and get ready for transfer. Um, because it doesn't matter what your curriculum looks like. What matters is, are you achieving learning outcomes that are useful to a student at the next level? Um, and you could change your, under this kind of a, under with an interstate passport, you could change your entire curriculum around and not uh, have to go through anything new with the interstate passport except posting up what your new course, uh, you know, patterns were that you required for your interstate passport because you still were saying, these are, these are the learning outcomes that we subscribe to. We just think we have a more interesting way of teaching them. And uh, that's fine. That's, you know. Um, well, uh, we often say that um, all of the work that the LEAPS uh, process, the multi-state collaborative, a lot of these other kinds of initiatives that are, are going on are really helpful in terms of thinking about quality. Uh, do we have the same ideas of quality across institutions, across states? Um, what does it really mean in terms of what students are, are doing? And um, but. Then the next question is, how do we put this to practical use? We like to say that the interstate passport is a practical application of learning outcomes that students that really gives students a benefit. It says, here's something that makes a difference for you. Um, and, and we, as uh, academic, uh, may understand what um, the importance of the quality assurance that we get from uh, uh, really looking at our curriculum and our courses with the learning outcomes in mind, that that's important. But students may not see the practical use of that. I mean, there's a passport is both for institutions and for students a practical application of, of learning outcomes. Um, one state has told us that their statewide course equivalency system was out of date. They lost a lot of funding for it in the recession, and uh, that hasn't been kept up uh, as well as it used to be that it um, inhibits innovation at their institutions because they can't get changes uh, into the system uh, quickly enough. And they're looking for a different way of thinking about that. Um, our statewide learning outcomes are pretty general and not well used. Uh, passport could help us take it to the next level. We've got a couple of states that have said, you know, gotten into, interested in the passport and then looked at their own state level outcomes and said, 
whoa, this doesn't mean anything. And our, our state has outcomes here, but we're not applying them. It doesn't, it's not really meaningful. We need to step back and really think about how we um, do this. <laughs> and one state said, well, we got our written communication people together, and they really like the, the passport outcomes. Can they just adopt them? And we're saying, oh, so you can, but please don't do that. Uh, you're much better off if, you, if you've got your faculty who are, are working on um, how learning outcomes look to you, and then, and then you'll probably find that they're pretty similar to the ones here, and that, that, that'll probably work pretty well. Um, well, our state sends a lot of transfer students out of state, um, and I suspect that New England is a place where that tends to happen. Um, and uh, hopefully you feel like you have a responsibility whether students come in or go out to the students that uh, are in your state at any given time and to help it in making that efficient. Um, <laughs> accreditation. Everybody's been, you know, uh, pushed pretty hard by their accreditors uh, to be focusing on learning outcomes. And um, I think that that uh, is uh, something that some institutions more than others feel like they still need to pay attention to, and this might be a way of helping them do it. Um, this, this one specifically, are, I think that, um, I think it was John who brought up Virginia as an example. This one is from Virginia. Um, they're saying that they, the uh, transfer was not, students were not transferring at a high enough rate. And they were thinking that using an interstate passport uh, as one carrot um, could help them to increase the passport rate. Right across the border, there's lots of them. Someone was just saying to me, was it this morning? I heard them talking about that they have, they're near a border, and uh, it would be really good if they could efficiently transfer across the border. Some uh, institutions have worked out individual articulation agreements with a cross-border. Uh, wouldn't it be efficient if that didn't have to be renegotiated every time you wanted to change a course? Um, and uh, performance funding that's partly based on post-transfer completions. We're interested in anything that might help. So that's another one that we've heard. Uh, and I think uh, Arkansas was one that uh, brought that one up. So steps to joining, you build campus system awareness about the interstate passport. Uh, you determine your own congruence of your passport, uh, of your pa uh, learning outcomes with the passport learning outcomes. You construct your passport block, the courses by which students can achieve the learning outcomes at your institution. You prepare to participate in the academic progress tracking. That is um, your registrar and your um, IR people. And most institutions that we know of uh, have one of about three different student information systems. And we have consultants who are working with uh, WICHE and um, building and have uh, the uh, scripts that you can use within your student information systems to, uh, so you don't have to build that yourself, to, to extract and send the data that um, have to do with um, the interstate passport. Uh, and we can give you a lot more information about that if, uh, if and when you're ready for that. <laughs> um, you, you can apply online. It's all on the interstate uh, passport. Um, .witchy .edu. <laughs> uh, there it is. Um, right now, and then you sign an MOA, which for like five five year commitment. Right now, we are still in the um, first five years free section. We have uh, uh, first 100 institutions. We're only up to 24, 25, maybe 26 now. <laughs> um, uh, so the first 100 institutions that join get their first five years free. After that, there is a small fee. Uh, to maintain the administrative um, uh, aspects of the program in the future absence of grants, presumably. <laughs> um, but uh, it's very small con considering. Uh, um, one second, I'm almost done. This is the last slide. <laughs> uh, and then if you have more information, uh, just contact. Yes, you have a question right I'm there. just wondering, does the passport have an expiration date? So in other words, when you complete this, do you expect that to no. this 10 years? No, ago? no. The passport itself doesn't have an expiration date. Uh, it's assumed that students going into specific programs uh, will, in some cases, have expiration dates on courses that they may have taken. 
And um, one of the things we're looking at um, at this point is um, integrating the building uh, visuals and understanding about how building uh, passport and pathways together because students need more than just general education. They need to have an idea about where they're going to get it. And I was just looking at um, the, uh, the University of South Dakota and thinking about, I went back to their website and was looking at uh, what do you have to have to get into, uh, for example, to be really ready and prepared to get into South, the University of South Dakota's computer science program. And if you came from anywhere with a passport, um, plus there's actually six more courses. So that is a passport plus a pathway. And the six courses obviously are more math and introductory computer science courses. Um, so there, uh, we're going to be thinking about um, giving people visuals about how you build a lot more of those um, pathways in, um, within integrating with um, passports. Um, but yeah, no, the passport itself does not have an expiration date. And um, one question that people often ask is, how do you handle differences in credits that people bring? And um, that is, um, you take the credits that come with a passport, and if it, they come with, say, 32, but your general education is 36, well, they still have to have the same number of credits to graduate that you require, but that might give them a couple of extra courses as electives or within their major or something else that they can take to get to the total number that they need. Uh, if they come with, say, 38, you only need 32 in your program, well, they will have six excess credits, but those could fit in often with, within electives that they would be uh, have opportunities for anyway or something else. But they would get all the credits, but um, you don't unpack it. We often, we've often often thought about how do you, you know, thinking about this, so you get all the, you've got these nine bags, as one of our consultants has talked about. You've got nine bags, and each one you, you, you that come, once you get the passport block filled up, you put each of these bags all, all in a box, you seal it up tight, <laughs> you, they take the box with them to the next institution, and the uh, registrar, the admissions people, uh, see it and they say, oh, a passport, general education done. And then, then it goes on to the program. You say, um, I'm applying to the nursing program. So those people then can open up the box and they can say, did you take statistics for your quantitative literacy course? I'm going to open that bag. Oh, yes, I see that you did. And then you say, but did you take developmental psychology within your social, your you know, uh, individual, human and society and individual? They say, oh, no, you didn't. OK, that's OK, but you need to take it here because it's part of the requirements for that program. So. Um, It'll be the most efficient is if you know what you need in terms of your program, uh, proposed program requirements. But for purposes of general education itself, it's just done. Um, yeah. Oh, it's all like that. So oh. if, if institutions can, if there's a little bit of a range in terms of the number of credits, as a receiving institution, how do you know how many credits are attached to that? The, it, the transcript will include courses and credits. And right, it will include what has indicate which ones are counting towards the pathway. Maybe not the path, the passport. I mean the passport. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I saw a notation that it was completed. Right. But you don't know what the you know what subset of their total transcript is part of that passport. If they if they come in with sixty transfer credits yeah. and between 32 and 38 are the passport. Okay, yeah, I'm a registrar, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. That is gone. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's okay. Yeah, there was one way back somewhere. Well, I, um, my question is, I'm assuming that you've had the greatest success with traditional liberal arts types of associate degrees transferring on to four because very often those kinds of degrees have a, a gen ed block like this built into them. But I'm wondering what your experience has been, and you started to answer it with nursing as a perfect example, those other kinds of occupational technical career programs, has that pushed the two-year uh, 
divisions among your partners to look at making changes internally, or is it made it harder for them to participate in the passport initiative? You don't you understand what I mean? They don't have they don't have uh, 32 to 38 credits built into a manufacturing technology program or a human services program, but they want to participate. How do they participate? I think that these, um, yeah, these really apply to uh, academic programs, not to career and technical education, or to even um, if you have programs that are applied baccalaureate degrees that do not require a general education core at the same level, they're probably not going to work the same way. Yeah. This is sort of a shift, it's more of a student type of question, but I'm sitting here, I, I work at a community college in Boston, and the students that I work with with the most transcripts from states are veterans. And, or even, you know, students may be benefited, they may not be benefited, but I see huge benefit implications for those students nationally as they move from state to state after their their um, enlistment stops. Um, and so th I, I just I'm really excited about this and just sort of thinking about what this means in the bigger picture. Two things. One, I want Pat to talk about. <laughs> but that's one of the populations that we have heard the most anecdotes about. They get discouraged because they build up so many credits that are not accepted at the next place. They're not even discouraged. They're, yeah. just, they're like, oh, it doesn't matter what I have in other schools because I have to start over. Yeah. That's the mentality that... Yeah. Is, well, eventually they get discouraged and just say, I've got so many credits and it doesn't, it's not adding up to anything and yeah. I, it's not gonna, I'm not going to spend more time doing this. Um, but uh, that leads to another question, which is, uh, what if somebody has part of a passport? Or what if somebody transfers in without a passport and then wants to transfer on? And that is up to your faculty to assess. If, if you are comfortable, confident, that someone brings with them um, um, <laughs> completed learning outcomes in the form of courses that you believe meet these criteria, your faculty can include those as part of their passport and complete the passport at your institution um, and award it at your institution. Um, but that is something that you need to determine that you are comfortable with. But it also gives, if veterans are aware that this is out there and they're making about courses that they're taking, maybe they don't know what they want to focus on as a major or where they're going to live when they finish. It gives mm -hmm. a, a structure within which to work, I think, which is great. Yep. One of the things about this program at this point is oh, we have these, um, that I might say, is we have these 24 institutions, or maybe 25 or 26 now. We've got a couple of people on the, in the line that are um, trying to get. Uh, uh, completed. Um, they are waiting um, for a lot more institutions to participate with what I call eager patience. <laughs> um, the proof of this and the benefit to students is really going to be realized when there are a lot of institutions um, that cover a lot of students, which means a lot of opportunities. For a long time, I think that once we get to a critical mass, kind of that tipping point, um, there won't be, it certainly is not going to be universal, um, but it will be a, um, a, a marketing uh, point for institutions that are passport institutions. Um, you know, we prepare you to go to any of these places, or we take the passport, uh, and which assures that your general education is complete. Uh, so I think that, um, that it's important and uh, to realize that uh, we're incrementally moving towards that point um, and probably aren't there to where we can say, what are the outcomes? What do you see? What are the successes? Um, and we need to have more um, participants in order to begin to um, do that research. And someone else I missed. Other questions? 
we are also available to, I think we need to get to lunch where we could be. Um, we are available to, obviously, to come to states specifically, to come to individual institutions, or to have more communication with you in other ways, electronically, um, to provide more information. And we encourage you to go to the website, interstatepassport.wichita.edu, for a lot of additional information. And we'd be happy over lunch or um, this afternoon to um, talk with anyone who'd like to have more conversation. Thank you so much for being here.